So ACE is based in salts. That's the big chapter, which is going to deal with all three of these. We're going to start with acids. Uh, if I talk exactly about the history of the word acid, acid originally means sour taste. Now, there were many acids which were a part of human life, vinegar, lemon juice, grapefruit juice, uh, spoiled milk. Uh, all of these were sour tasting because of the presence of acid. And we used to call them organic acids. But their sources were usually animal and plant material. But then we have some mineral acids as well. So if you take a look at the table at the bottom, this is going to help you with it. This is page number 120. And this is the table that students are usually automatically memorize since they are going to interact with this, these acids a lot in this chapter. Now, let me clarify myself by saying that we actually cut out a few portions of this uh, table. This is it. We don't do these parts anymore. And this T is wrong. This is not a part of the formula. Rest, we are supposed to do the whole table, organic acids as well as mineral acids. Let's go, go through them just for the sake of understanding quickly. Asnoic acid, the formula for which is CSPCOOH, is a weak acid and is usually found in vinegar a common eatable. It's a preservative as well as it is a flavoring agent. Methanoic acid, the formula for which is CHCOOH, is weak and it is usually present in ant or nettle stings. It is also used as a kettle descaler. What is a kettle descaler? We're going to study it as a part of topic 5.4. Okay, so moving on, lactic acid, which is a part of sour milk when milk goes bad, but remember, if the milk goes bad, we can't drink it, but we never throw it away. We can actually turn them into really fruitful stuff. Let me tell you that most of the sweets that you are commonly familiar with come from sour milk. So as soon as milk goes bad, we don't throw it away. We actually save the milk fat from it, and then we turn it into usual sweets. Uh, the milk is converted into curd, by putting some bacteria in it, by what it goes bad, we start eating it in the form of yogurt usually. The milk is converted into cheese by adding some acid. The milk goes bad, we separate the cheesy parts of the milk and throw away that watery portion, which is not good for consumption. So uh, if I be specific, Pakistani or Arabic let me tell you, most of them are made the same way. So remember that we don't throw it away. We can actually put it to some very good use. No, moving on. The trick I said, remember I've cut these formulas. You're not supposed to memorize these. The rest you will remember because they are a very important part of your memorization. That is also weak, and citric acid, as the name suggests, is a part of all citrus fruits, lemons, oranges, tomatoes, grapefruits, you name it. All those citrus fruits contain citric acid. There are some vegetables as well that contain citric acid. For example, uh, green peppers or bell peppers also consist of a good amount of citric acid. Moving on, mineral acids are the ones that are usually formed from minerals. Usually they are stronger acid in comparison to uh, organic acids. How do we come up with this strength? We're going to define it a little later towards the end of this chapter, not really at the start. So let's keep that question for now. Now, carbonic acid is one of the weak acids among all strong mineral acids. The formalization is CO3, and as you're pretty familiar, that is a part of fizzy or soft drinks. All soft drinks have carbonic acid in them, which is when allowed, uh, when the bottle is open or which is when allowed to move, it actually bubbles and carbon dioxide actually goes out of these soft drinks in the form of bubbles, which is a common part of uh, many places in the same chapter. The, the topic we just left up top, the second paragraph on the same page was also discussing about the same fact. Now, moving on, hydrochloric acid, HCl, strong acid, uh, we clean metal surfaces with it. This is the dilute acid, which is found in humus, stomach, and most of the uh, animal stomach. Now, 
Nitric acid, HNO3 is a strong acid. This is used in making fertilizers and explosives. In our house, nitric acid is usually a part of floor cleaners. We use it to clean floors. We use it to clean marble tiles, specifically washroom tiles. Now, uh, sulfuric acid is the next one. H2SO4 is the formula. It's a strong acid. And the major use is car batteries. This is one of the old questions. If you're going to look up from papers from 2010 to 2014, one use of sulfuric acid about car batteries and has been discussed over and over again. Now, it is also used in making fertilizers, which is a part of this book. We're going to study it in chapter number nine. Paints and detergents will also be discussed as part of usage of or consumption of sulfuric acid, again, in chapter number nine. Moving on, phosphoric acid, H3PO4, is a strong acid. It is used in anti-rust paints. Those paints do not allow rusting to go for the metal. And it is also used in making fertilizer. Again, that all points which are for making fertilizers, actually most of the acids are used to make fertilizers. And yes, they will all be considered in chapter number nine. So these uses are just words right now. In chapter number nine, we're going to actually put them to good use, convert them into proper formula for fertilizers, their names, even the chemical equations are going to be considered. So, this is both the introduction of acids. We are familiar with most of the acids. We know about the properties of acids, that most acids are strong and corrosive. They are dangerous. They can eat your clothing. They can eat your skin. They can attack stonework. They can attack metals. Mineral acids can almost attack anything among, among the named ones. So whenever we are dealing with acids, we try to keep ourselves safe and safety precautions would be a part of chapter number 12. And this chapter as well, when we'll be going through some uh, practical stuff. Moving on, the next thing would be indicator. What are indicators? Indicators are certain colored substances. Most of them have been uh, extracted from plants and some really beautiful colored flowers, red, blue, purple, most of them come from flowers. Now, they change color if they're added to an acid or alkaline solution. They do change, uh, show a different color sometimes if they're neutral, neither acidic nor alkaline. So those uh, acids, uh, sorry, those indicators are discussed in the next page. As soon as you see this table, let me clarify that this table discusses litmus as a litmus solution. Now, most of the students I've seen are familiar with litmus papers. So if I go a little, little bit downwards on the same page. On my left hand side, you're going to see this. This is a good mnemonic to remember about the litmus paper colors. Litmus paper only come in two colors, red and blue. Now the blue one turns red in acidic solutions and the red one turns to blue in alkaline solution. So this is why this is threaded. So there are just two colors for conversion. However, this is for litmus paper and for phenolphthalein. For most of the cases, uh, indicators are going to show three different colors, colors in acid, neutral color, color in acid. For which I was stating that this is a litmus solution, not litmus paper. So the difference is litmus paper is bound to just two colors. Litmus solution, however, shows you a purple color in its neutral form. Red, purple, blue. This actually comes from a specific flower. Actually, uh, not just one flower type, there are many flower types which almost show the same colors in different pHs. So if you take the flower and plant it at different soils, neutral soil, it is going to show you purple color. That flower will show you red flowers if it is planted in an acidic soil. And if planted in an alkaline soil, it would show you blue flowers. So the same plant can show you different color of flowers in different soils. That what, that's why uh, most flowers can show different colors. And one of the reasons why flowers are so popular, because in different parts of the world, they are different types of soil. They actually come up with different colors. Phenolphthalein is the one which is at a disadvantage over here. Take a look. Every one of them is showing three different colors, acidic, neutral, alkaline. 
Loftlin is at a disadvantage because it is capable of only showing two colors, pink and alkaline medium. However, you cannot differentiate between neutron and acidic medium because in both the cases, it's colorless. So that's why sometimes you will be asked to choose an indicator and your preferences, specifically in paper six, the ATP paper would matter. And there you can easily quote that methyl orange is a better indicator than phenolphthalein. Why? Because methyl orange is going to show you three different colors in acidic, neutral, and alkaline medium uh, when phenolphthalein is only capable of showing two. I hope you understand why phenolphthalein is at a disadvantage, right? Yes. Okay, so moving on. Apart from these single indicators, let me clarify a bit uh, from your session, one more indicator has been added to the list. It's not a part of this book, but it's a part of fifth edition of the book. So what I'll do is that I am going to take this table out from the fifth edition. I'm going to send it to you through WhatsApp. I think bromothymol blue has been added as an indicator. So I'll definitely share the colors with you in acidic, alkaline, and neutral mediums. So you, the, that uh, indicator will be added to this list. You're not going to remove any indicator from this list. You're supposed to prepare all of these. There is one more addition to it, all right? So we'll do that added part as well. For now, moving on to the next indicator, an indicator which we consider superior to all other indicators and hence the name universal indicator. And it also has a name of full range indicator. We also call it a rainbow indicator since the colors of this indicator are going to imitate the rainbow. Now we really have seven colors in the rainbow, but this is going to be something bigger. It is going to show you more shades. So it is going to have 14 different colors. But again, we actually bifurcated into seven different colors for our own ease, which is also imitating rainbow or imitating the spectrum of light, visible portion at least. So I hope you have an idea. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet are the seven colors. Indigo is missing from here. But those are the seven colors that usually children tend to memorize when they are in uh, junior classes and they know so we have those same shades, but we have a proper scale, which we call a pH scale, which goes from zero all the way to 40. Now this scale actually is capable of showing you colors. Uh, now I am going to uh, mark the names to the colors so that you can bifurcate it a little more. Since you have seven colors at the bottom, but you have five words up top. So strongly acidic is going to be represented by red. Weakly acidic is going to be represented by orange. For yellow, I asked my students to use the term very weakly acidic, that you can at least uh, give examiner the idea that you have some uh, bifurcating adjective. Neutral and green are going to be on the same line. So this really is indigo this part as you can differentiate between this color and these three. So weakly alkaline and indigo, strongly alkaline and violet. So what are we going to ask the uh, term blue as? Blue is going to be very weakly basic. You can use the word basic, you can use the word alkaline, both terms are uh, conform one another at this point, at this point only, and means the same thing. So mark it up so that you don't have a problem uh, representing a specific adjective uh, with a specific color. So this gives us a very good idea. This also gives us the idea with numbers that in between zero to three, we have strongly acidic, three to five is weakly acidic, five to anything before seven is very weakly acidic, seven exact is neutral. Remember, 6.9 is not neutral, 7.1 is not neutral, just 7 is neutral. So 5 to 6.9 is can be considered as very weakly acidic. In the similar way, 7.1 to 9 would be very weakly alkaline, and the 9 to 11 would be weakly alkaline, and anywhere from 11 to 14 would be strongly alkaline. So the numbers, the colors, 
the objectives all match to one another. Hence, universal indicator is considered as a great indicator. So on top of all other indicators, this is going to be your first reference. Most of the time, you are going to experience questions in paper four or paper two or paper six. Now the point I'm about to raise goes for all three papers, MCQ, theory, and alternative to practical. In those cases, they may come up with a scenario. They may use an indicator in the scenario and they may ask you for a better alternative. For example, if they have used not mean, a better alternative can be methyl orange or bromothyl blue. Something even better would be a universal indicator solution. All right. So you can always go for a better indicator. But on top of all of these things, uh, we first need to define what pH is so that this may pose some more sense to you. And also, there is a very great alternative to all of these indicators. What is that? Let's come to discuss it. But first of all, pH scale. Now, pH scale is the scale of which where we measure the strength of an acid. Uh, Soren Sorensen, a Danish biochemist, worked upon it, and he actually gave us the rules for pH scale. Acids have the pH less than 7. The more acidic the solution, the lower the pH. Neutral substances such as pure water or sugar solution has a pH of exactly 7. Alkalis have a pH greater than 7. Again, stronger the alkali, and you might need to add this point, stronger the alkali, higher the pH, right? So just like it works for acid, that acid is stronger uh, if the solution has a lower pH. In the similar way, alkali is stronger if, the, if it has a higher pH. Closer it is to 14, stronger would be the alkali, right? So more acidic is the solution if lower is the pH, if it's closer to zero. The more closer it is to zero, the stronger or the more acidic is the solution. So adding a fifth point would really help. So we define it in a very good way. So if it is anything smaller than this, we call them acids. If it is anything greater than this, sorry, it shouldn't be that way. So if it is greater than seven, it is considered to be, I shouldn't be doing this. If it is greater than seven, it would be anything which would be alkaline. This exact would be neutral. It's a good way to show it. Now, apart from all of the indicators, pH meter, which is a digital apparatus, as you can see, this is a manual pH tester. However, something much better, a digital pH meter. Now, let me tell you, in terms of measuring pH, this is the most accurate piece of equipment. Why? because all previous scales were able to discuss pH in whole numbers. Now, this one is great, whole number, then there is a decimal, and there are two more digits for the accuracy. So nothing, no pH paper, no uh, indicator, not even universal indicator has been capable to go to this level. Since this one is talking about a whole number, and two more decimals attached to it, this should be your first voice in measuring pH. All right, so moving on. Yes. Something that looks like a useless table, something you're not going to memorize, something that has nothing to do with uh, the portion that thing over here, but, but this is really very important. Now, there are pH values of the most common solution. Remember, all of the things have, that have been mentioned over here first were converted into solution, dissolved in water, and then the pH was noted. So whenever you look at this table, let me tell you, you do not memorize this table. Okay. So one thing that you know for sure and you can memorize is this. We've already discussed it in the previous set of points that pure water 
of sugar solution has a pH exactly seven, and this one's neutral. Now, what does this kind of table represent? Maybe our everyday life, the things we are using, either they're acidic or alkaline, the things that are already present in, inside us. For example, our body has blood, our body contains urine, our body contains some gastric juices that are a part of stomach, which, which was actually the top of the table. So uh, our, may our body contain it, maybe we using it on daily basis, maybe it, it is a purely a chemical for the lab. All these things are present as a part of this table. But why this table is important because they have created many different scenarios and you can always come up with a solution for it. Let's say I'm going to create a scenario and I'm going to then ask you questions from it. Let's say you are at home and you were about to do something uh, with an acid and there was some uh, random accident. You were trying to be careful, but still there was an acid spill on your skin. Let's say your arm, a little bit of it. Now, obviously, we all understand as soon as you're going to have an acid spill, you are going to have a very itchy feeling. Now, this is a very poor form of irritation, and we need to cater it. Now, considering the alternatives you have at home, you need to neutralize it with something alkaline. So what do you think you will have at home, which is alkaline and can neutralize the acid spill. Out of this table. Um, so could you please repeat yourself? I'm saying, uh, you were working with an acid, accidentally some of the acid spilled on your arm. Now you have a very irritating uh, kind of feeling, scratchy feeling. You can't really scratch it. You need to treat that acid. Let's say, for the sake of understanding, you can treat that acid with something alkaline from this table. Now, I've already brought this table to a, a point where you can only see the alkaline portion from it. Now, which items from this table will be a part of your house? Some of these are commonly used at home, is alkaline and can treat that spill for you. Means you're going to take that substance up you're going to uh, slightly rub it up on that part of your arm where you had the acidic spill, and after some time, you can have the relief, finally. So what are among these things is alkaline is a part of your home that you can apply to the spilled portion of your arm. Great idea. Okay, why not household ammonia? That is commonly a part of our houses, and is commonly used as an oven cleaner. Because it is a strong one. Uh, right, strong this is too strong. Instead of getting rid of the previous rat, it is going to give you a new one. Very good answer, toothpaste. Because we need something weakly alkaline. All right. Now, vice versa, if you had a case where you had uh, an alkaline spill on your arm, and you need to treat it with something acidic, which one are you going to use as a part of your daily household? Um, Come on, it should be easy. Your answer needs to be something acidic, capable of neutralizing or giving you relief. This time you spilled some alkali and you need to treat it with something acidic. What are you going to use as something acidic, which is also a part of your household? I can't hear you. Vinegar. Vinegar, very good option. Vinegar is a common part of our kitchen and we can easily find it in homes. It is not too strong. 
and it, is, it can easily work. So, well, we sometimes underestimate milk, but milk is somewhat an easier option. You may or may not find, find vinegar in a home, but you would definitely find milk in every home, right? But vinegar is also a good option. Make sure the vinegar is not too strong. You dilute the solution first uh, by adding water to it, and then you can use it. Let's move on to 5.2. So 5.2 is acid and alkali solutions. Now we are going to discuss acids and alkali solutions with importance of hydrogen ions. These are the hydrogen ions because of which we called uh, the pH as pH. Now, the explanation of the word pH is given right over here. A German scientist came up with this word potent hydrogen, which means the power of hydrogen ion concentration in a solution. These are the hydrogen ions which when present in the solution, uh, something like water, H positive and OH negative ions are exactly equal. So water is neutral. When we dissolve acids in water, we have excess of H positive ions. When we dissolve bases in water or alkalis in water, we have excess of OH negative ions. So basically alkalis and acids make very good electrolytes. And th that is because they actually change the balance of water. Now, the diagram at the bottom explains the same concept in a much better way. Let's go with the diagram, but before we move, uh, this pink portion is important. The hydrogen ions in acid solution make the litmus go red, and the hydroxide ions in alkali solutions make the litmus go blue. So these are actually H positive and OH negative ions, which are the active portion of an acid or an alkali. All right, let's understand this diagram. Pure water is actually an equal balance of number of H positive and OH negative ions. Combine these two, you get the formula of water H2O. So water is an exact balance. It has exact same number of H positive and OH negative ions. So the pH always stays at seven. When we add a little bit of acid in water, it actually disturbs the balance. Now we have more H positive ions and we have less OH negative ions. Hence the diagram with a greater box for H positive, heavier and pointed towards bottom, a smaller box for OH negative, lighter and pointed upwards. In this case, the litmus paper goes red. We already know that, okay? That's why this is pointing towards a red end. Vice versa or on the opposite, alkaline solutions have a higher concentration of OH negative ions than H positive ions. In this case, the entire case changes. OH negative ions have a higher concentration, H positive ions have a low concentration, and litmus paper turns to blue because of which these arrows are pointed like this. So I hope now you understand when we add acid to water, what are we doing in the background? In the background, we are actually increasing the amount of H positive ions, and these are what are acting like acid. These are responsible for the change in pH. These are responsible for changing the color in litmus. H positive ions turn them red and OH negative ions turn them blue. So when it comes to that, we actually define acids and alkalis in this definition. So this is a more appropriate definition of acid and alkali. So far, we have been discussing the properties of acids and alkalis and how they behave or how they taste like or what kind of color changes they are going to give to the indicators. But now we are going to define these. So acid is any substance that when dissolved in water produces hydrogen ions, H positive. This solution has three characteristics. It has an excess of H positive ions. It can turn litmus paper from blue to red whenever the pH is checked, pH would be lower than seven. Alkali, on the other hand, would be a substance that when dissolved in water, produces OH negative ions. So this solution will also have three characteristics, but on the contrary, opposite to the acid. So it consists in excess of OH negative ions. It can turn red litmus paper into blue, and it has a pH higher than seven. So that is a good way to define acid and alkali.
Now, if you're asked to define acid in the exam, make sure you write all of these three points and not just write one or two. All these points together form one definition of acid. These are not separate definitions. I hope you got my point, right? Yes, sir. Now, you might notice something similar in both of them. Although every characteristic point is different, this thing is similar in both acid and alkali. These are the substances which are checked when they are dissolved in water. So water must be very important. And yes, that is. That's why we have this specific topic, the importance of water. An acid is not an acid, it's not dissolved in water. An alkali is not an alkali, it's not dissolved in water. That means an acid will be acid when it is dissolved in water, and an alkali will be an alkali when it's dissolved in water. What does that mean? It means the acid is going to give us uh, an excess of H positive ions only when dissolved in water. So is the alkali is going to give an excess of OH negative ions when dissolved in water. So water as a solvent is very important and that's how we can differentiate between acid and alkali. That's how acid is capable of giving excess of H positive ions or the alkali which is capable of giving the excess of OH negative ion. I hope they, this makes more sense to you. Now, moving on, yeah. <clears throat> since that clarifies uh, for both things, remember, acids and alkalis can be strong or weak, but they can be used in dilute or concentrated solutions. Dilute means there's a large amount of water in small amount of acid and alkali. Concentrated means we have used less water and more amount of acid or alkali in comparison. So the strength has nothing to do with dilution. Dilution, dilute and concentrated is something different from strength. All right. So I hope that makes more sense. All right. And 